Um, there's two questions I have. Um, one is, the first one is, how do you show the two maps A and B about, um, the first one was, uh, I think, um, productivity and how it cru crucial certain areas of productivity, the second was biomass density, right? And I was just, yeah. and I was just wondering, how does um, the, the productivity loss of an area group correlate to its biomass density? Because, for example, the Amazon rainforest, I think the productivity loss was not so crucial, but the biomass was still quite dense. And the second question was just on how do you come up with the number of the five, I think, five billion, five hundred billion dollars? What is that based on? Is it based on the cost of timber? Or yeah. Cost of timber? Very good questions. Uh, the first one, um, the difference between the two maps, I, I really, I didn't think I had enough time really to explain them, so I just thought I'd show you the maps. Those maps are I'm quite the same as productivity and biomass. The, the biomass one is biomass, you've got the second one right. The first one, it's a bit complicated, it's how important proportionally species richness is for productivity. So productivity is way is much higher in the tropics than it is in the boreal. You know, it's higher than the it's kind of productivity maps matches the biomass map. But the importance of species number for productivity, proportional to how many species there are to start with, I realize it's a really complicated and bad but the proportional value of species richness is much higher in the tropic in the boreal. And that's because in, in one area of forest you can only have like five to ten species, so on average seven species. So when you lose one species, you lose a lot of productivity. When you lose the next species, you lose even more productivity. Once you lose three or four species, you've lost four times more productivity. So there's a huge impact there. Whereas in the true there's there can be 200 species or 500 species in hectares. And so if you lose one, well, obviously it's important. It's nowhere near as important as if you lose one from the board. So that's what that first map shows. It's a bit more, it's a bit sort of convoluted. But it's really the importance of diversity for maintaining current productivity. Um, but that's the paper that we've just, we've just had accepted. The, the biomass one, I think, is going to be much more, meaningful, much more meaningful from a carbon storage perspective. The other one is important from a how important biodiversity is perspective. This next one will be, this is how much carbon there is, this is how much carbon will be restored when you restore forests, this is how much carbon will be saved when you save forests. You know, it'll be a, a, a direct what can reforestation do to put in the climate cycle. Um, and your second question was how do we come up with that number? That number, it's also, I'm glad you asked that because it's based purely on the timber market, the timber industry, the economic value to the to timber stocks and to pulp and paper and to um, essentially logging and the use of um, the use of trees for whatever people use it for. There's loads of other ecosystem services provided by forests, as you all know, you know, climate prevention being one of them, but also water provision and, you know, all sorts of uh, provisions which we do not take into account in that economic analysis. That's just the timber market. And so it's really a massive under-evaluation. The value is really much, much higher than what we're saying. It's just that it was the easiest, low-hanging fruit, an easy way for us to get a number that we could calculate. And even that, just the timber market alone, the value is still higher than the cost of effective conservation. So if we spent just 200 billion on conservation, we would be able to maintain those, that forest biodiversity, and then we would save 500 billion. So it economically makes sense to restore, but to maintain and, and conserve biodiversity. That's really what I'm there. I would suggest I collect a few questions probably to make best use of your time. So let's see, what other questions do you have? <laughs> Uh, so the productivity means um, amount of carbon taken up 
over a, I think our minimum time was a three year period. It's usually over a period of time. So you just quantify the amount of carbon in the forest now, and then the amount of carbon in the forest in three years time, that difference is the productivity. Um, and what was your second question? So we are working with economists at Cornell who are, you know, they've spent their whole lives evaluating the value of different ecosystem services from different ecosystem types. And yeah, we're in the process of coming up with that model. But it goes beyond me. I'm not an economist and I don't know how they're... We're just giving them the data about productivity and the maps. And with that, they're trying to... They're generating information on GDPs and data from all over the world. and. Um, but yeah, we're, we're in the process of doing that. Don't ask me how. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm not a policy expert, um, not, not at all. Um, but one question popped in my mind um, with, with all the mapping that you did, is, is there any possibility for actionable recommendations for like pre, -trans, uh, pre planning activities with regards to? Um, Let's say, you know, this is the, for example, in this, in this region, this would be the minimum amount of species that you would, you would have to consider for tree planting activity to actually be effective with regards to CO2 or carbon biology. So, those are the values. Those are exactly the information that we're doing these maps for. So, we're, we're much further along with the tree density map, that first one I did, you know, the three trees being trees. And with that, we I showed you the follow-up layers that we can create where we can say where you can plant trees, how many trees you can get in those areas. But that was just the number of trees. We're in the process of incorporating all the information about the size of those trees, the biomass of the trees, the height of those trees, the species richness of those trees. And those are the two layers that I, the two maps that I showed you at the end. Definitely within the next year, the, the more funding we get and the more the, the, the faster we can do this, but ultimately that is that is the, in, exactly the goal. We're going to come up with maps that show where the most important biodiversity and where the most important carbon stocks are for the people who are conserving. So they can say, right, if we're going to have to choose where best to conserve, we'll conserve this pixel and this pixel and this pixel. And we will also generate equivalent maps of where forests can be restored and we'll say how much biomass could be restored there, how much, how valuable biodiversity is in those regions. So they will definitely be products that come up with each one of these maps, yeah. Very quick um, is, it, is it possible for you guys, or, or could that be a next step to also recommend on the, on, on the effect, like most effective species for a certain, for certain bio, um, for, for certain systems? Because um, I, I'm, I'm just thinking about yeah, like eucalyptus being like pretty much everywhere on the African continent. Um, pretty much destroying biodiversity while it would still grow it because it's like fast growing. Um, yeah. So that is a bit of a limitation for us because we know certainly foresters have good ideas about which trees are the most productive in which parts of the world. That's not the information we're generating. But we are generating new information about which species can coexist with who and where. And so we will be able to provide information like this region would be most optimal if you restore more than 10 species or more than 20 species and this is a list of the species that would effectively co-occur and by combining those species you would have a greater potential for biomass uptake. We can definitely do that. What we, we, what we won't really be addressing at the moment anyway is which of those species are the best for car capturing carbon. They could, you know, sometimes one you know, there's certain trees that are more and less productive. We're not capturing that information right now, but we hopefully further down the line, you know, this is only two years in. I'm hoping to do this for the next foreseeable future. We're definitely going to get as much information about each one of these species. We're currently in the process of doing something that I don't think we could do. Um, we're getting species distribution maps for every single one of the species separately and overlaying them on top of each other. So that's about 9,000 species 
further over that, so then we can like click on a pixel. You say how many species are there, how many species can be there, how many how much biomass can they store, what densities can they exist in. That's ultimately the plan. Wow. <laughs> Hi. 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 You have awesome research. It's funny because I worked with Time for the Planet and then I saw your research report. And I said, that's great. I thought, that one could be really helpful for Time for the Planet. So, I was a little out of the loop. But um, we're one of the partnerships, well, two partnerships we're working on in the Oregon area is with the Friends of Trees, which plants trees as shade trees in urban areas. And the Portland Street Tree Project, which plants trees in low-income inner-city areas that have food. And so you know, they're providing food as well as shade and other benefits. And it turns out that separately, I think it was Portland State University did study on tree islands. These places where you have all concrete, the heat bears down, and those are also the places where the poor live or most vulnerable to dying. So one thing I'm wondering if you could consider for a future research project that would overlay well, I think, through this, if you aren't already doing it, is to look at the feasibility and the social and financial impacts of planting trees in inner city areas around the world, where you have a high amounts of urbanization. Uh, because, of course, trees might like a you know, big area spread out, but they can be fairly productive, I think, in really small, sometimes spreading areas. So that's that would be one of the Great question. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I'm delighted you asked, you spoke because, you know, urban reforestation is one of the most, it's so valuable. It's, it's different questions that I'm, that I'm talking about now in, in my things, but, you know, urban reforestation is critical for human welfare, happiness, as well as all of the actually critical ecosystem services, and like cooling, it seems like a really valuable one, and water retention and all sorts of stuff. Um, and we are doing local scale, I'm, I'm involved in a couple of local scale projects, one uh, monitoring productivity and, and ecosystem services in the New York's million tree plane, so they've had a million trees, and we're monitoring recruitment and biomass production and carbon uptake there. Um, but the problem with my global scale stuff is that at the moment, the re resolution isn't, it's too coarse to really say things about a tiny city. We can, essentially, because it's such a global model, we're, we're relying quite heavily on area, on averages for an area. So within a within 100 pixels, 50 of them will be slightly too high and 50 of them will be slightly too low. But we can say on average that 50 pixel area, that 100 pixel area on, on is really strong. We can robustly say in this larger area how many trees there are. So we can guide larger scale restoration, but at the, at the scale of the city, these global maps are not, they're not good enough. You know, we could be many trees out. Um, so I wouldn't use these global models for that. But there is a huge amount of open forestry research going on and I'm sure you already know about it, but I can also, I, I've read a lot of urban forestry projects and I've worked with a lot of people who are researching urban forestry for various different ecosystem services and I'd love to connect you with those guys or forward on papers and, and incorporate that information because it's really important. It's just not quite the questions that we're addressing at the global scale. Through a website that I have, that I'm, you know, my working web 
website. Anything we, we create, we just make it freely available. Anyone can go on, but you have to be familiar with GIS to be able to get out anything out of it. Otherwise, it's just pictures. Um, but I mean, I can send you the pictures when you like. Um, the other thing is, really, our limitation at the moment is science works much more slowly than conservation wants it to. You guys are doing stuff all the time. And you, you're speaking to people and trying to get something. And, and sadly, science, because we, it's such a rigorous process and we have to go through the revisions of 10 different people and you know, it's a really slow process. It, take, it took two years to do that first tree density map. Studies are coming much more rapidly now than we have the data set, but still, the, the speed of science isn't often up to date with the speed of conservation. So that's what I want to do more by connecting with you guys is find the questions that are going to be important so I can start addressing them now so that when you guys need it, that information will be available. And I can also summarize as much information as we possibly can give to provide it to you. So if you need a map for uh, a project or for a discussion or a negotiation you have having, go through Felix, you can contact me and I can send everything and anything we have. Uh, I'd be happy to share everything we possibly can with everyone. Um, because, you know, I'm also frustrated by how slow science happens compared to conservation, and so we will share absolutely anything, but ultimately everything we publish, once it's published, will all be freely available on, on my website or, you know, online, wherever you want to search for it. And a quick add-on to this, if you go on our website and uh, select the tab um, creatively named Tree Study, <laughs> you will be able to download um, the study that was published in Nature last year, uh, with the three girls petroleum trees. Okay. And maybe we could put up the science paper as well. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Great. Um, I think will I also take great uh, Tom, this invitation that you made for us actually to de um, develop recommendations what kind of questions um, would we um, like to address to you that maybe could shape your future research. And this certainly is something that we would need some time to digest and get a bit deeper into what you shared. Um, and take some time with small groups and come up with ideas and so forth. I can well imagine this to be an ongoing process from now, maybe to be finalized in a few weeks or months in the global board. Um, but I think it's very great that you put out this invitation to us to come up with concrete wishes, basically, as input to the scientific process. And that's, uh, I think that's just a great potential to make use of that channel and communicate to you. So that's something I think we all take away from your presentation beyond the rich information you share. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, Felix, you want to add something? <laughs> yeah, I just want to thank Tom again for taking the time to talk to us. And um, just in case someone missed this, the video we watched earlier was a um, projection, a model made by NASA, which was based on Tom's data, right? Yeah. So this data is used in models um, um, done by NASA. And I want to thank Tom for spending all these years um, researching this while people laughed about the fact that he was counting trees while they were um, counting hectares. But um, yeah, Tom continued doing it and it was a huge success. People also sometimes laugh at us for counting trees, but this proves that it's the right <laughs> method to go about it. And um, some of you might know that, well, or you probably won't know, but um, Tom has got offers from many different universities, including Harvard and, and Princeton and so on. Um, to be a professor there, but instead of doing that, he wants to work with us for the next years to continue these, this research and, um, and answer these questions for us. And because of this wonderful, uh, because of this, we're doing our best to get um, Tom funded for the next years so that we can make this possible and answer all these questions. And lastly, um, we have a scientific board at Plant for the Planet, uh, which also includes Dr. Pachauri, who we talked to yesterday, and Tom is the chair of that scientific board. <laughs> Thank you.